Welcome in, everyone. It's the lawyer you know, and I've got my dad, George Tragos, on with me today to talk about the Ghislaine Maxwell trial, federal criminal trial in New York. Um, it's a high profile trial because of all of the celebrities and money and power and eyes that are on it because of what happened to Jeffrey Epstein earlier in this saga. Um, but it's all coming to a head basically with this federal criminal trial. It has uh, recently gone to the jury. So they're deliberating now. Closing arguments are done. We're going to talk about closing arguments today. Um, we're going to talk about kind of the case as a whole. And we kind of have a cool, um, what I consider a treat and a special way to do that by getting access to what we believe from, it looks like it's from the court's docket, these PowerPoint presentations from the defense and the prosecution for their closing arguments. So we'll be able to see and talk through as two lawyers that have been prosecutors and defense lawyers, um, we'll be able to talk through kind of what their strategy is, why they decide to break down the case like this, why they put this information in slides, how they get this information. Um, and, and it's interesting because in state court, you wouldn't usually file your PowerPoint presentation, but in federal court, sometimes they make you do that. The rules are a little more strict, um, especially if it's a real contentious battle. Um, What's on your screen, Dad? You might want to minimize whatever's on that back computer screen. Um, but the, you know, sometimes when it's a real contentious battle, um, the court will make you actually submit your PowerPoint so that each lawyer can go through it and see if there's anything objectionable in that PowerPoint, see if there's anything inadmissible in that PowerPoint, and you can kind of have that battle before the bell is rung in front of the jury so you can't unring that bell. So we're going to go through those closing argument presentations probably pretty quickly today, just kind of pulling out some highlights. I especially want to focus on the defense's um, closing PowerPoint because it really puts you into the mind of a criminal defense lawyer and what they do in these cases, how they poke holes, how they try to chip away at a prosecution, which I think this closing argument does a good, uh, a good job of doing. But before we get to those closing arguments, Dad, why don't you give us kind of your overall thoughts about the case, um, how it's kind of been presented from what you've seen and um, just what your experience tells you on how a case like this goes. Well, the, the case was a, is a tough case for the defense because so many people are saying so many things about your client. Um, the, you don't have just one victim, but you have four victims. You don't have... Um, uh, a, a, I guess a low key, low profile kind of case, but it's a very high profile kind of case. It, it delves into the life that very few jurors even know about, you know, multi-million dollar homes all over the world, private jets. It's a lifestyle that the jury is going to find very interesting. And it's going to find it to be um, very seducing because, you know, putting a young girl in this lifestyle, the jury is going to see that and they're going to put themselves in that kind of a situation. So it's a, it's a really tough case. Plus, the key defendant in the case is not there. Um, when, you know, you've got uh, Epstein is not there. And, and this case is all about him. The testimony, the witnesses, everything is about him. And the prosecution couldn't get after him. So they go after the number two person. Uh, in the lifestyle or in the home, or uh, she's characterized as the number two person around there that she kind of runs things. So they've gone after her. Uh, they're the only ones, she's the only one left to go after. And it, it's kind of a sad proposition for her because everything's coming down on her because Epstein is dead and committed, you know, allegedly right. committed suicide. And it's the whole trial they haven't tried to hide the fact that a lot of this comes down on Epstein. We've heard his name over and over again. We've heard about his actions. We've heard about his house. We've heard about his lifestyle. We've heard about his civil lawsuits and settlements and the funds and the millions of dollars he's paid out on these victims. Um, so they haven't tried to hide from him, but both sides have kind of attacked the Epstein bomb different ways. The prosecution has basically said she and Epstein are one and therefore she's guilty of just about everything he did. The defense is saying it's all Epstein, it's not her. So they're both talking a lot about Epstein. And, and I think it's funny, and we're going to bring in these closing argument presentations now. Um, and bear with me here, because I'll be going back and forth between the two. But so first from the government, 
their first few slides, the purpose of it is basically to show, as you can see here, Jeffrey and Ghislaine have been together a couple for the last 11 years. They work really well together. I can't imagine one without the other. They're great partners and best friends. Then we get to some of the photographs of them together showing how close they were. Clearly, they are a couple because the prosecution's strategy is they are one. Everything Epstein did, we can convict Maxwell for. Basically, I know it's not everything, but that's what they're trying to get across from the jury, the generally bad guy rule. All the bad stuff that happened to these women, Epstein may have been the one touching them, even though certain victims did testify that Ghislaine Maxwell also touched them. But even for what Epstein did, she desensitized these girls. She made them feel comfortable. She ensnared them. She entrapped them. She was the Mary Poppins of this situation, okay, on the private jet. Then they talk, they show some of the homes so you can get an idea of the money and the power that these people had, the private islands, okay? And what's interesting now is if we hop over real quick, this is the beginning, the first 15 slides of the prosecution. So if we hop over real quick to the defense's closing argument. It starts out money and manipulation memory, which is their theme of the case, which we can talk about in a little bit. But they also have pictures of Epstein's houses and Epstein's cars. You know, notice, Peter, notice something. Whereas the government put these pictures up, the slide for the defense says Epstein's planes, Epstein's houses. So they made sure they used this as a visual aid for them to concentrate the jury's eyes on the name Epstein when they're looking at these. And Epstein's helicopters and Epstein's bank accounts and Epstein's message pads and Epstein's flight logs and Epstein's private islands and everything from Epstein's house. Yes, they have some pictures of them, but literally the first 11 slides for the defense almost mirror the prosecution. That is very unusual. Usually one side will have certain evidence they want to highlight and talk about as very important. And the other side will have a different set of documents or pictures or witness statements. But in this case, like I said, it's so interesting that they are both diving in so hard on Epstein. One of them trying to marry them together and everything they did. And the other trying to focus it all on him, all the blame on him, all the punishment on him. And Maxwell was just a bystander like the pilot, like the groundskeeper, like all the other witnesses in this case. She didn't know what he was doing behind closed doors. She was his girlfriend. She was as unknowing as everybody else. That's basically what the defense is trying to go through. So as we continue, and we'll get back to the states or the government's um, closing in a minute, but I want to go through the defenses here quick. They go through. The lawyers that each of these victims have, they make sure to connect them together. And how the lawyers said to cooperate with the case, it would help your case. They talk about how all of these victims have lawyers. They've all had settlements and been paid. How they've been telling them that these lawyers are advising them of what they need to do and say in order to get into that compensation fund. Some of them in the closing argument even changed their story and changed their dates in order to be of age to get in that compensation fund. So we can see the defense is trying to pick apart and poke holes in the government's case. Well, and, and, very, and they also mentioned, don't forget, we're talking about multi-million dollars each. And the testimony also came out of how much the lawyers made out of this. Uh, what the lawyers' fees were, which you know amount to about a third, roughly, of the money they collected. So the lawyers had a tremendous incentive to get these people, the, these alleged victims, to say what needed to be said in order to collect the millions, because they got a third of it. Right, and this is so we're talking about this is the defense's strategy. We're not saying these victims lied or made anything up, but the defense's strategy is to set it up. They all had lawyers. Lawyers were telling them what they needed to say for the case. That goes in with the memory expert we'll talk about later, who think that or who testified that these victims memory was shaped by the lawyers by the Epstein fund by what they needed to say to get that money that this is the theory of the memory money manipulation right I was, I was just going to say those three words uh, are it's an excellent uh, strategy for the defense to keep those three words up because it's a common thread even when you talk about lawyers and those clients 
Right. And I thought what was great is the prosecutor actually flipped it in rebuttal and talked about how money manipulation memory is exactly what this case is about. Uh, Epstein's and Maxwell's money, because that's how they had this power to manipulate people. And these memories faded because they were traumatic events. And, you know, people have issues with memories all the time. And so they flip the theme, which is an old mock trial trick, which is funny, takes you back to law school. Um, okay, so the next thing that they do, right? So at first, they talk about um, the bias and how they had money and lawyers and everybody involved shaping their testimony. Then they get to impeachment and poking holes and inconsistent statements and things that they um, strategically forgot. That's what the defense lawyers are trying to show here. When asked if, uh, if Maxwell was in the room, you said you weren't sure. I do not recall was the victim's answer. You said you don't recall whether or not the government, um, you told the government that Maxwell and Epstein were alone together in the room. You were not sure it ever happened. You recall that, I don't recall. As you see here today, you're not sure whether you ever were in the room alone with Ghislaine Maxwell and Epstein, correct? No. So they're impeaching her testimony. These I find so interesting as someone who does a lot of civil work. Interrogatories from the civil cases when they're suing Epstein and they're laser focused on Epstein, they're asked questions like this. Identify all persons other than the decedent who ever committed or attempted to commit sexual misconduct or offenses against you. None was their answer. Under oath sworn. That to me is important as a lawyer. You guys let me know. You guys let us know. As a juror, does this piece of paper from another case, does that hold a lot of weight to you or the fact that these victims took the stand and said, she absolutely did it. She absolutely was involved. She touched me. Do you think that's more powerful and something you'll hold above and beyond to beyond all reasonable doubt to convict Maxwell on? Well, I, I think the others, and what struck me is when they were doing, I think at least two of these victims, when they were being interviewed by law enforcement about this, did not mention Maxwell. They only talked about Epstein. And then the only time Maxwell came out was afterwards when they were actually going to try to con collect from the fund or when they were doing this criminal prosecution. But all the abuse, everything they talked about to criminal investigators was, Max, was uh, Epstein the whole time up until the end. And then they talk about how, and, and there's, this is a common theme with a couple of the victims that have sued other people for uh, sex trafficking and other things like I think Farmer, the one that they did, or is it Farmer or Roberts? Roberts, the one that didn't actually testify, was the one filing suit against uh, Prince Andrew. Um, there's so much going on in this case, but they used that to kind of impeach this witness, Jane, because she sued her principal, teacher, and guidance counselor. They just bring that up basically to make the victims look bad was one of their strategies in this case. Um, and then we had some interesting stipulations like this that were put up on the screen and some arguments throughout the case. And you may think, why is this important? Well, they stipulate that Lion King on Broadway didn't even come out until 1997. That's important because a lot of the testimony had to be before 97, I think it was 94, in order for them to be minors and underage and for the actions to be criminal and illegal. There was also some testimony that the defendant, defense wanted to get into that I don't think they did, that Maxwell didn't even live at a certain residence until 97, when a lot of the victims test, testified that things happened there in 94. And these timelines are really important because of the age of consent. And we heard the judge give instruction. Dad, why don't you talk about that for a second? Why were well, these witnesses allowed to testify when the judge instructed the jury that what they're going to testify about is not criminal behavior? Why would they be allowed to do that? Because they were trying to show a pattern. They were trying to show a, a modus operandi, as what you know, people have talked about, where the pattern of conduct, even though, for instance, um, in one of them, she was 17 in England. And in England, being 17, it, it, you have consent. You can consent to sex. So she didn't come to the United States until she was 18. So all the things that happened to her were all legal. But because she was, again, according to the, the theory of the case by the prosecution, uh, she was groomed the same way the others were groomed. She was manipulated the same way the others are manipulated. The judge allowed that in to show a pattern of operation of Epstein and Maxwell and how they also work together as a team. So they allowed this to come in to show that pattern. And it makes, so, it, it, and it makes sense. 
Is it kind of like other bad acts? It is kind of like other bad acts, except it's not a bad act. It's strictly to show a pattern, which 404B allows you to do. It doesn't necessarily have to be a crime for it to be introduced in evidence, another crime, but it can be a method of operation of how you actually operate. See, because to me, I, I have the instruction on the screen. I'm not sure if you're able to see it, but for me, if the judge has to tell the jury the alleged phys physical contact she says occurred with Mr. Epstein and Maxwell in New Mexico was not, quote, illegal sexual activity. You can, sorry. However, to the extent you conclude that her testimony is relevant to the issue before you, you may consider it. But you may not consider this testimony as any kind of reflection on Mr. Epstein nor Ms. Maxwell's character or propensity to commit any of the crimes charged in the document. That to me seems so damning that even if you say something like that, is a jury really going to buy it? They're not. And every prosecutor knows that. And this is um, to Annie Farmer, yeah. just, just to be clear. Yeah. Every prosecutor knows that, that a jury doesn't know the difference between character testimony and testimony of this method of operation. Um, that's what the rules of evidence try to distinguish. But frankly, how was the jury really understand that kind of an instruction? They're going to use this evidence and they're going to say, gosh, this guy does this to everybody uh, and he should be punished for it. And then, you know, she helps him manipulate these girls. She should be punished for it. It's, it's, it's almost impossible for the jury to not say this is character evidence. And to me, I mean, that's why you call them, in my opinion. That's why the prosecutor calls them. So, but again, I really want to hear from everybody listening. We're going to get to questions kind of at the end, but as we're talking, I'd love to know everybody listening or watching's comments and thoughts about what we're talking about, because while the prosecution gets to put these victims on and they get to tell a long story and they're on the stand for hours, potentially going through everything in detail that happened to them. And then when the defense crosses them and they just have certain questions like this one, as you sit here today, you're not sure whether you were ever alone in the room alone with Ghislaine and Epstein, correct? No. So even after that whole story, they get this one chip away that the victim says they're not even sure they were ever alone in the room together with her when this abuse allegedly happened. How does that make you think and feel as a potential juror? You just heard the whole story. Does it all crumble with this one question or are you willing just to kind of let it go because memory fades, but you believe that the traumatic event happened and they remember enough about the traumatic event? Plus as a juror and, and you know, your, your viewers should think about this. That's why you tell jurors not to make up your mind until the end of the case. This was a pretty effective closing argument. Um, they went through every inconsistency that these uh, victims spoke about, where they remembered or didn't remember. Remember, this has got to be beyond a reasonable doubt. You might think this happened. You might believe this happened. You might think it probably happened. But don't these uncertainties in their testimony give you a reasonable doubt? And that's why you've got to wait to weigh all the evidence and to listen to these closing arguments. Now, to me, in this case, and the reason we're focusing so much on the, the defense's closing is it's just interesting, and it can really help you as viewers see what they're trying to do and how they do it and how they construct it and see how effective it may be. Because in a case like this, the prosecution has all the cards. They've got all the evidence. They've got federal agents helping them investigate. They've got one of the most hated people in the world, Jeffrey Epstein, connected with the defendant in this case. Most of the world hates Maxwell at this point. They are very, very, very likely to win and get a conviction in this case. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Just like lots of federal cases, like we talk about, just like a lot of sexual, sexual abuse cases, when there are multiple victims, the conviction rate just goes up. We've talked about that. But we're focusing on this just to think about and see what you all think about one statement that may be inconsistent based on an hour of testimony and how that makes you think about everything these potential victims say. And how does the civil lawsuit in cases like this make you feel about a victim's testimony? Because I think most of us don't have a problem with a victim suing their abuser. Most of us don't have a problem with somebody suing somebody that sexually abused them and ruined their life. So I don't think it has that big of a, an effect, but you guys let me know. And one of these uh, victims kept a journal and yeah. nowhere in the journal did she mention Maxwell. Right. I mean, that's just astounding to me that you keep a, German, a journal of the abuse and not mention Maxwell. Uh, another thing I'd like to, I'm just curious because your, your viewers are, are kind of like jurors when they're looking at this, is 
do you think the government did the right thing? The government in this case made a decision. Their decision was marry Maxwell to Epstein. That's the way you convict her, as opposed to just her on her own, just what she did, her touching breasts or her doing the, the things that she did. They kind of downplayed that. They mentioned it, but it certainly wasn't the focus. The focus was, like you said in the beginning, they are one. Was that the right way to do it? Yeah, most people, um, most people that watch this and comment on this will absolutely say, yes, they think it's fine. They think she should be punished. She was involved. Um, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. I think that there is plenty of evidence that she was always there and at the very least was criminally negligent. Um, I think it's hard sometimes to, and I also think that the reason a lot of these victims put none in the lawsuits against Jeffrey Epstein and didn't mention Maxwell is because the abuse was so much worse by Jeffrey Epstein. Um, one of the things I would talk about is why only four victims? Because it seemed like there could have been a lot more with how everybody was talking about it. And we didn't even hear from Roberts, which I thought was interesting. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So let me just quickly keep scrolling through here. So as you can see, they put up a lot more not sure and their title of the slide is Jane can't remember because it didn't happen. And again, focusing on memory. Don't remember if Maxwell ever kissed her. Don't remember if Maxwell ever touched her, did this, did that. Never used sex toys. Um, I don't know how many times it happened. Um, there were other women involved that weren't Maxwell. They impeached some of these um, victims by saying they and their boyfriends were doing drugs at the time. There was a slide on that. And then they get back into the lawyer telling them what to do. Yeah. Go ahead. How many years before they reported anything? And the, the fact that they kept their relationship up with Epstein even after this happened, uh, they, they, they would call him, they'd meet him, uh, they'd ask him for money uh, well after this all happened or well, even after it stopped. Okay, I did. I wanted to get to the expert here. So then they also, so this was interesting, Dad, and I want to talk to you about this. So where were the witnesses? The uh, farmer's sister, who they talked about a lot, never testified. I did find that weird too. Other employees at the ranch, friends listed in the diary. Where's the missing journal, right? So they talked about this missing evidence. So the defense was trying to call witnesses and had on their, so people were making a big deal. The defense had 35 witnesses or something on their witness list. They only called a couple. Um, but they did want to call former FBI agents to talk about how sloppy and criminally negligent this investigation was. The judge didn't let them do that. The judge let them make certain summarizing arguments like this, like their, where was the evidence? Where was the witnesses? They didn't do a good enough job, but not actually put on direct evidence that the FBI did a bad job or was negligent in their investigation. So as someone, meaning you, who loves to put on that kind of defense, why do you think the judge didn't let him put on that defense? And do you think it's going to be an issue for appeal? Well, I think it will be an issue for appeal. Um, there's actually a lot to do with the witnesses because the defense claimed they also had some issues with witnesses and, and wanted to have some time to get some witnesses in. And the judge denied them that extra time as well. Because the, because the government's case was supposed to take four more weeks. Right. And so but talk the judge about the denied FBI, Talk case. about the FBI investigation. That's what I really want well, to talk about is. Well, the FBI investigation, guilt or innocence, doesn't necessarily abide with how good or bad the investigation is. And unless the uh, defense can show that because of that investigation, she is innocent, or there's a reasonable doubt because of the investigation, apparently they didn't satisfy the burden of making it relevant and admissible to a jury. Sometimes it is. I'll be honest with you, there's been times when I've been able to put on law enforcement experts to say that this was a bad investigation, and here's the reasons why. Apparently, in this, in the defense wasn't able to convince this judge. And, I mean, let's face it, this is, she is a, a pretty good judge uh, that you've got here on this case. I don't know if this was brought up earlier, but you know, she's been appointed or nominated for the second district court of appeals. Um, and during the three day recess, right in the middle of the trial is when she actually had her Senate hearings uh, for her confirmation to be elevated to the second district court of appeals. So she's a well-respected good judge. 
She didn't find that they met their burden of making it relevant to this particular case in this investigation. And it may be it... because the investigation was an Epstein investigation and not a Maxwell investigation. That could have been has... a reason as well. Do you think it has anything to do with um, the stuff they want to protect from the high profile individuals, former presidents, princes, royalty, whatever, because what would they have found out if they would have gotten more into the investigation? A lot of people are talking about that. Um, and then also, we had a case where this happened to us in federal court where they stopped us from talking about a police investigation and what they did and where they put recording devices and things like that based on national security um, right. objections. That's the only one I can remember us really getting blocked from talking about how federal law enforcement investigated a case. I honestly don't think the high profile figures made a difference. Uh, they were testified to during the course of the trial. Their names did come up during the course of the trial. So I don't, I don't really think that's it. I really think it was the burden of showing that this particular testimony went to guilt or innocence. And I think that they failed to do that with regards to Maxwell. And some of it may also be because of the way the government was presenting their case and that the government presented their case as the Maxwell Epstein relationship was what made her guilty and, and not these other extraneous things, which is why, by the way, I know you haven't talked, I don't know if you talked about this, why she didn't take the stand. Um, because I think that this way, the defense limited what was going to come in because they didn't want it to make a really broad statement. And this investigation testimony might make it really a broad amount of testimony could, you know, drag the trial on another couple of weeks. So they have more inconsistent statements here, like, was the massage sexualized? Was it not? Um, they have some settlement documents, $1.5 million for sexual abuse in a movie theater, which was him touching her foot and her arm and her leg. Um, which Maxwell again, had nothing to do with. Well, she was there one of the times, she said. She said one of the times her sister was there. And again, so where's her sister? That, that's the thing that's hard about this is there was right. other women and people involved too. Um, all right, I think that was pretty much it besides the memory expert. Um, here we go, Professor Loftus. So or a, a distinguished professor Memory is malleable. Memory weakens over time. Memory is impacted and corrupted by post-event contamination. So here's my issue, Dad, just to start off. Defense expert, whatever. You could say this in every case for every witness of all time because every case takes years to go to a trial. And whether it's 20 years or three years, you can say that your memory has been affected by the time, right? Right. And these are all the things that they said affected the victim's memories, media, interviews, lawyers, lots of money, conversations, all may be true, but it doesn't mean that what they're testifying to is false. So talk well, about you, how, hold on here, because they answer this specific question. How does a criminal defense lawyer use this type of expert testimony without being able to prove that, yes, this may be true, but that doesn't mean what they're saying is a lie? Well, they use it the way this defense lawyer used it. You do a chart, you make all the issues of all the things that could affect their memory. The, the sad thing is, uh, and I think the studies show, jurors aren't that influenced by this because this particular expert never examined the victims to make any kind of a determination if the victims were ever affected by any of these memory problems. Yeah, you know, so the fact that she gets up there and just says people have bad memories I don't think that's going to sway any jurors unless she was able to say, I interviewed and I examined, I tested this victim and that victim's got a memory problem. Yeah. That's and the only think, way it becomes effective. Yeah. And that's interesting. So she used other things in this case that, that we all knew she had, which was the lawyers being involved, the media being involved, that they got these settlements for millions of dollars. So she tried to pull things that were already evidence in the case and show how that could affect someone's memory. Let me see if there's anything else just kind of goes through how it can be subject, subjected. Hey, I tell you, that, that can be, that can cut both ways. The jurors maybe could excuse some of the memory lapses of these victims, provided they remembered the key elements, because you're going to remember, according to experts, the trauma type testimony. So yes, I remember being abused. I don't remember that it was six o'clock and, and the sun was up. 
Yeah, I, those are inconsequential memory items. And so, and then they finished by going through each of the charges, talking about how there's reasonable doubt and how you have to X out all the charges. They talked about presumption of innocence <clears throat> and how Maxwell doesn't have to prove her innocence. We've talked about this a lot on our channel. Reasonable doubt, same thing. Um, not all possible doubt. And then they finish with not guilty on all counts. So uh, that, go ahead. Well, there, there's one other thing that people might wonder. Why aren't the penalties uh, on there? You've got all the crimes, but the jurors don't know the penalties. They don't know that the trafficking in a minor is a 40-year possible sentence. And so the jurors are never told that. And the rule is jurors never know what the punishment is. Punishment is up to the judge. So you never tell jurors what the punishment is for particular crimes. And that's why you don't see the punishment there in those when they were going through those crimes. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's really important in this case that the judge will be the one making that determination, not the jury. Um, but you know, to me, one of the weird things, and I see some comments about it in the comments, is you heard about all this horrible stuff Epstein did. And then some of the testimony was about touching someone's foot in a movie theater or, you know, some things like that weird shouldn't happen and is a, a small picture of the bigger picture. But I thought we would have, and there was some testimony about touching of the breasts and how every time she was with Epstein in a massage, it was sexual and, um, and things like that, that were horrible. But some of the witness testimony to me, I thought I was thinking it was going to be worse. If that makes sense, I was expecting worse. And I wonder if, the jury was also expecting worse from some of these victims. And I wonder how that'll affect it. But let's, let's scroll through here, the uh, prosecution's case. So their big thing was lady of the house, her and Epstein were one, like you said, married them together and everything they did. The household manual, it, it referenced Epstein and Maxwell, not just Epstein. She wrote parts of it, Epstein and Maxwell, Epstein and Maxwell, as they went through over and over again throughout this book and the household manual. Um, and how she authored, um, you know, what shampoo and massage products they need. That was something that she authored. Um, the sex toys were talked about. How they were left in Maxwell's room and cleaned up and put where Maxwell needed them. See nothing, hear nothing, say nothing. Obviously creepy and horrible and an indication bad stuff's happening, in my opinion. Um, supposed to be blind, deaf, and dumb. How, and then they talked about how they select victims, how they kind of uh, craft them to be how they need to. Why don't you talk a little bit about how when there's a conspiracy or a big RICO case and you have a very clear head of operations and you've represented that person, but you've also represented, and just recently a case we pled, you represent some of the other people that get involved. Maybe it's number two person, maybe it's a lower level person. Maybe it's a company that got involved, whatever. How do you navigate those waters? Um, and, you know, like I just said, we pled. What, when do you choose to plead? When do you not choose to plead? Um, how do you handle that if you're, not, if you're not representing necessarily the head of the snake, but they're trying to come after you with the pressure from the head of the snake? Well, there's, there's two jury instructions or two statutes that make a difference. One is aiding and abetting, and the other is conspiracy. If you aid someone in committing a crime, you do anything to further that person to commit that crime, help them in any way, you are just as guilty as they are. And uh, in fact, um, in conspiracy cases, you can, they talk about different types of conspiracy. One is the wheel conspiracy. Big guys in the middle and all the spokes of the wheel go out. And even though you're way out there on a spoke, you're just as guilty as everybody else that's involved in this conspiracy that centers around this one big guy. So if you're aiding, if, if, if uh, Jelaine is aiding or abetting in any way, the uh, Epstein in what he's doing, she is just as guilty as he is. And that is their entire theory is the aiding and abetting theory, because they really didn't, again, focus on her actually doing bad stuff. They really focused on Epstein doing bad stuff and she procured the girls for him. And that was their whole theory. Uh, in fact, some of their arguments, like she was with him for 11 years, how could she not know what he liked and didn't like? She yet they had, ran the household. Yet they had, 
yet they had a pilot testify who flew him all over the place with these girls on the plane, potentially. Right. I mean, that, that to me is, I agree she's done things criminally, but I think some other people that potentially testified in this trial or haven't been charged yet were also involved in this criminal enterprise in my opinion. Well, I, I, frankly, I think, I don't know if anybody, everybody was truthful that testified when we think right. about it, you know, because, you know, people are hung around all these years. How could they never know? Um, I mean, it had to seem unusual that young girls were hanging around all the time or that were, you know, flying to Europe and doing those things. No one questioned that. That's the problem. Oh, absolutely. And then, you know, and we've talked so much about these victims' uh, statements and testimony, but that she did feel on breasts and did touch them, um, groped them personally, uh, especially, I think this is Jane, um, Carolyn. So they, there was actual touching involved and um they talked about uh let's see here they were frozen in fear they'd never been in this position to see male parts before um who would tell you how he liked being massaged it was maxwell maxwell would give the instructions it was sexualized here's a picture of the massage room um 14, 15 years old. They went through all the victim statements, as you could imagine. And I, I actually think they did a really good job, as I said, of flipping the testimony or uh, flipping the the um, defense's theme. Let me see here. I've got some notes from the closing that I thought were really interesting. Well, Go I ahead, think, Dad, if you get some saying. Well, I was saying, bringing the massage table uh, into the courtroom and setting it up, I thought that was a pretty dramatic moment for the, the jurors to be able to visualize what it was like and how it actually happened. Um, we didn't get to see, I'm sure there are probably, in, in, in this, we've seen some things that are blacked out. My guess is those are images of the other girls. We didn't get to see what those other girls looked like when they were 14 years old. You know, and the jury could look at those girls and frankly, they could be so horrified by that, that they didn't hear the rest of the testimony. Because uh, jurors can shut down. They make, sometimes they make up their mind right away. And once they've made up their mind, it's very hard to turn them around. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting how I just scrolled through kind of the amount of money uh, Ghislaine Maxwell received, $30 million from Epstein. And they talked about how Carolyn got $300 for her um, work or whatever. He gave her $300 and how that, you know, that shows that this case is about money and manipulation. Um, I do want to talk about the counts, but then I also want to talk about a theme. So before we get to the counts, a theme of the prosecution's closing and their rebuttal which they get to come back after the defense did their closing and do a rebuttal was corroboration. How they had eight witnesses. They all said the same thing. They all corroborated each other. They were all consistent for people that are not lawyers. How do you feel about that? Do you think that eight people coming saying similar things is the end all be all. And that makes you believe it a lot more. Or do you expect, that if a certain lawyer or a certain side calls a witness, that witness will be good for them. And that witness will say something consistent with the other witnesses. What do you expect? Because as lawyers, we expect them to say what they said before, to be consistent, to stay in the story. That's why we call them as witnesses. Now, we all saw the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, or a lot of us did, where some of those witnesses absolutely were not good for them. Um, and we also saw... Uh, uh, Binger not call, I'm sorry, sorry, let me, let me start over. But we also saw Binger discuss in an interview how he considered not calling Gage. He ended up calling him and we all thought that was a pretty bad idea because Gage basically sunk their case. Well, we saw that they did not call Roberts in this case. They did not call Virginia Roberts in this case, one of the named victims in these counts, probably because of all the other baggage she had and they felt the case was strong enough without her. So the decision to only call certain witnesses and not others. But I want to know what you all think about when we as lawyers say all the evidence was consistent, all the witnesses were consistent. Do you say, duh, you called all of them, they should be consistent? Or do you actually say that does make sense? Everybody has the same story. Just food for thought for you guys. Well, keep, keep in mind, too, for you when they're, when they're making these comments, is that these cooperative witnesses did not cooperate any sexual activity. All they did was cooperate that these young girls were there, but they didn't see anything improper 
None of them. All right. Uh, let's get to the counts now, and you can kind of give us your thoughts. So count one, conspiracy to violate federal law. That's what you're talking about. Conspiracy means if, if Epstein did it, she can be on the hook too. Number two, enticement to engage in illegal sexual activity. So again, not necessarily that Maxwell committed an illegal sexual activity, but that she enticed the minors to do it. Conspiracy to violate federal law. Again, count three transportation of an individual under the age of 17 to engage in illegal sexual activity. Count five, conspiracy to violate federal law. Count six, sex trafficking of an individual under the age of 18. So that's the 40 year one, I think. All of those are grouping in Jeffrey Epstein's actions. So you can see why they did, why they charged what they charged. And here are the specific counts. So very interesting to me. What did you think when you looked through these two uh, closing arguments? Anything surprise you about them? Anything stick out? Um, what, what were your kind of overall thoughts about the closing arguments? Uh, again, I, I don't know if it was a good strategy for the prosecution to kind of lightly brush over her individual actions with the girls. Uh, I, I think I would have emphasized that more, him, you know, touching their breasts and actually participating. Uh, they spent far more time just uh, doing the relationship than they did the actual acts of sex or sexual things that uh, Maxwell was accused of doing with the girls. Uh, I thought they did that a little, they were a little light on that. I thought the defense did about as good a job as they could in laying out the inconsistent statements and showing how at one point they never talked about Maxwell. Today, they talk about Maxwell. They get $3 million because their lawyer came with them for the interview. Remember, they, they emphasized some of these girls actually brought their lawyers with them. Um, so you know, they got millions of dollars. Um, I, I think they did a good job. They were consistent. I just don't know if they can overcome the fact that you have four individual girls young girls, all saying how they were uh, manipulated, groomed, whatever word you want to use for Mr. Epstein. And then also, I do think that having the former boyfriends and the parents corroborate that they were involved with Epstein, they were getting calls from women, that this is true, this did happen, I think adds a lot of weight to what these girls said happened. I, and I, there's no doubt in my mind that some of their memories are not clear. Anybody that says they have perfect crystal clear memories of something that happened 25 years ago is just wrong. But I think the trauma and the, the sexual abuse that happened and who was there and who was compl complicit in it, complacent in it, I think that was very likely true. And I think maybe, you know, what day it happened on or which of his houses they were in, especially if they were using drugs and trying to forget what happened and they you know had these sexual encounters in new mexico new york and florida and all over the place maybe some of those details may have been wrong um, because of the memory issues but i highly doubt all of the um, behavior was wrong and then one other question i have for the, the crowd watching and i'm also now going to solicit your questions because we're at the point of um, the video where we're going to start reading questions from the chat and I'm going to start kind of from here and work my way down. So if you have a question, throw it in the chat now. But do you think, and dad, let me know what you think. So we always, if we're the criminal defense lawyer in the case, want to get into the fact that they have these civil settlements. They filed these civil lawsuits. They've gotten millions of dollars because of this to show the bias that they can make money off of this. But the prosecutors in this case, I thought, did a great job of saying they've already been paid. They have no financial interest left in this case. That, A, I think was a good job. Number two, if I'm a juror and I don't know any better, which is what I want to ask everybody here, if you don't know how all of this works and how settlements work and difference between criminal and civil, filing these claims, filing these lawsuits, do you think that because they got a $3 million lawsuit, that that means she's guilty and she did do something or else they would not have paid these victims for what happened to them? Doesn't that, the fact that they've been paid, doesn't that corroborate their story? 
doesn't that show that something happened to these girls that was horrible? We all know car accident cases that get a $200,000 verdict or a $100,000 settlement. $3 million, something very bad happened to these girls. And obviously somebody agreed with their, st their story. That's why they got $3 million. I don't know. I'm, asking, I'm wondering if, if it backfires on us when we do things about settlements. Well, I, I don't. I, I, think, I think that it's legitimate to think that $3 million could color your testimony. Okay. And the fact that they were already paid, would, the way I would counter that is they were paid the 3 million. They better not change their story today or they're gonna to have to give the 3 million back. So they're stuck with their story to get the 3 million. So that's why they've got to say it today. All right, so we will start with just the fireworks, okay? From New Chris, who usually does bring the heat. Father George, you raised a great son. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think it would be fair for us, for U.S. citizens or us citizens, to know the names of every elected official, past or present, that visited that island. So, obviously, we're never going to find that out. We're never going to know that. But my question is, based on this question, do you think that if Maxwell gets convicted, that's going to open the door to expand further into when into everybody that was ever around and could have potentially seen or been involved in this sexual abuse? Where is it going to stop? Do you think once they get Maxwell, they're going to hope everybody's satisfied? We got our scapegoat. Let's move on. Let's hope this all goes away. Or do you think it's likely to continue? Because we've got some high profile people, like you said, the judge, the prosecutor obviously has a very famous last name. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I don't know if we don't already know all of the high profile people that were on the island. I, I, I don't know that. I mean, I mean, you know, you think about it. We know about presidents that were there. We know about the so Princes, we not, presidents. I mean, are, there, are there princes? I mean, are there other people we don't know about? It, it seems like they've all been leaked out. Uh, but there could be some, you know, I don't know if anybody will say, aha, you know everybody now. I don't know that, but it certainly seems like we know everybody that's really important. Right, and, and I don't think we're ever going to find out everybody, but, but what, to answer my question, do you think this is going to make it go into more people, or do you think everybody's going to hope it just goes away now and everybody's quiet about it once they convict Maxwell? Well, I think there's a, there's a good chance it might go away because of the Epstein Compensation Fund. Um, that fund is designed to take care of all the victims. So if there are any victims, they can go there to get compensation. Other than victims, I don't know where else that they're going to go. I, I, I'm not sure that they're going to go anywhere else. But what about the prosecutor? What about criminally? Do you think they're going to investigate anybody else that's on those log books that have been redacted and under seal? Do you think there's any potential criminal liability for anybody else involved? Because in my opinion, I don't feel bad for Ghislaine Maxwell. I think she put herself in this position. She profited on it. She was involved. She deserves to be punished, in my opinion. Just my opinion based on the evidence I've seen and the testimony I've heard. But I, the only thing I think is unfair about it is I'm sure that she is not the only one that helped him do this and that was involved and took part and also touched well, these girls. Problem is, where's the evidence? I, I mean, we've seen, so oh, they presented, there. they've presented the best they can against her. Okay. And she was there for 11 years and you've got all the testimony we've heard about. We didn't hear really a lot of testimony about anybody else doing any procurements. We heard that there may have been some other women involved, but that was an isolated incident. Um, so I don't know if they're going to have enough evidence to pursue anybody individually other than her. Because, again, you certainly heard in this trial, there really isn't anybody on her level that, uh, that have been around. Nobody they want us to know about, at least. Yeah. All right. KC, what law school did you guys go to? We are both double grads from the Harvard of the South, Florida State University. Go Seminoles. Um, let's see. Katarina, what do you think a fair sentence would be? Are any of these minimum mandatories? I, I usually don't look that stuff up. I do, not think, I do not think they don't look like minimum mandatories. They look like a maximum of 70 years. Uh, you've got the one count of 40. The others are five and 10 year counts. I, I, I don't know what the sentencing guide, federal court has sentencing guidelines where there's recommendations to the judge. There's no way really with us not seeing the score sheet to know what the sentencing guideline is going to be. Uh, my guess, you're looking somewhere in the 10 to 20 year range, if you want my guess. 
So I think it'll be even worse than that. I think they'll make an example of her potentially. Um, there'll, there'll be an Epstein tax to pay potentially, but we'll see. Uh, so when you look at the score sheet, so that's why we can't actually know what it's going to be because on that score sheet, you fill out a lot more than just the crimes she's convicted of. Right. There's also, if she's got any priors, if she's got any connections to other things, you put that all in the score sheet and then it comes out with a range, right? And usually it's in months, like 12 to 180 right. well, months. Where you were talking like about um, uh, Farmer, is that the one you were talking about that wasn't a witness? Robert, the Farmer yeah. evidence Robert. actually could come into the, that, Robert, it could come into the sentencing. They could oh, use yeah, the, okay the other other bad acts type of thing. Right, they could use her in to increase her sentence. So that's why you really don't know what the sentencing guideline is going to look like. What are your verdict predictions? So we're waiting on a verdict now. The jury is deliberating the six counts. What are what are your predictions? Uh, I predict guilty. I think guilty on all six counts. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, can you go into Prince Andrew's exposure? Does he have diplomatic immunity? Does the lawyer, does the lower legal age of consent in the UK put him in the clear? I have no idea about diplomatic immunity. Yes. Well, it does put him in the clear though. Okay. He, he is absolutely in the clear because of the age. Okay. Yeah. And I don't think he's got a lot more exposure. I know Roberts was suing him. I think that case got thrown out or they settled or they found that. What I thought was interesting is they found that he was in the class of the Epstein fund, which is like, that's not a class I want to be in. I get it if I get sued and I can wash my hands and not have to pay any money, but that is not a class I want to be in, is the Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein uh, fund class. All right, so we've got about five or 10 more minutes. Um, let me know, does anybody else have any questions we can answer here before we sign off? If you haven't already, please hit the like button if you like these lives where we can get some interaction and Q and a going um, and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. So you can be involved in future discussions. Uh, let me see here. Just saw one. Why aren't the parents sued Jane's mother failure to protect? I had a lot of these questions during the R hmm. Kelly um, trial uh, that these parents that were letting, if you want to say letting or even encouraging because Epstein has this money power influence their daughters or kids to go into situations like this? Do the parents have any potential exposure civilly or criminally? Well, they could have some civil liability with the uh, family services, Department of Family Services, uh, taking their parental right. I mean, let's face it, at this point, the, the children are all adults. So there's really nothing they can do now. Um, they would also have to oh, yeah. have some knowledge of this happening when it happened for it to for something to happen then. But again, it's it's way too late. Uh, they're all over 18, so there's no uh, situation where the parents have any civil liability at this point. And by civil, I mean their parental rights being taken away. So when you talk about experts like they call Dr. Loftus or whatever her name was, the memory expert, when you have certain experts that you've seen as experts on other cases and continuously the jury doesn't buy it. Why do criminal defense lawyers still continue to hire those experts and put them on? Especially if they have stuff like um, uh, a witness for the defense or whatever her book was. Well, you, you know, you always have hope. Uh, you always have, okay, this is something, and, and your client, try everything. Your client wants you to do everything you possibly can. So you try. You hope it has some influence. Sometimes it is effective. Sometimes you have to do it because the state's putting an expert on. If the state puts an expert on, you have to put an expert on to combat what the state says. And then the studies show jurors reject them both. But if there's only an expert on one side, jurors at that point are tend to believe the one expert if you don't have somebody saying the other stuff. But jurors kind of look at experts as a little bit of a hocus pocus. Um, and they'd rather look at the facts and make their own decision rather than like, for instance, this particular expert, I'm sure she is wonderful, well qualified. Um, obviously, she's well qualified. But what could she tell this jury that that jury doesn't think they already know? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, really? All right. So a quick one. Are you doing a program about Elizabeth Holmes tomorrow? 
as soon as the verdict drops, unless it dropped during this video and I don't know it, I'm going to try to jump on a live as quickly as possible with Pete so he can give a breakdown of the verdict and we can talk about that case. Yes. Michael Palmer. How was Annie Farmer, I assume is AF, and her lawyer able to lie in motion to intervene, saying she was sexually assaulted and molested by Maxwell multiple times in New York when she didn't meet her until New Mexico? So th this will be hard for me to give you the specific details because I'm not sure which motion you're talking about. But this is one of the things that the prosecution kind of throughout the case was saying certain details may not be perfect because it was 20 years ago, but the fact that the abuse happened is clear. Um, the, and, and then also the dates, maybe the, the New York stuff happened after she met her in New Mexico. So when things like this happen and people make statements, it's not necessarily automatically thought of as a lie, but they can make inconsistent statements for which they can be impeached, which is not the same thing as committing perjury. So I think that's kind of how her lawyer and her were able to do that in motion form. Do you know specifically that about this motion? I have not read this motion. I do not. I don't. Okay. I but I'm um, sure that I'm sure there's two sides to this case. So if she lied in the motion, I'm sure the other side is going to point that out to the judge. Right, exactly. And that was impeached with a lot of them with certain timing. And that's why they talked about why it was so important that Maxwell didn't live here at that time or that Lion King didn't come out until this date to try to show the age of when this stuff happened. Carrie Adams, do you think they will put her in protected area in prison in protected custody? I think there might be a good chance of that. Uh, high profile people, they do uh, segregate them a little bit to make sure they're not in general population because there is a risk to high profile people. Plus, there's a risk in prison. Uh, child molesters are not a well-respected class in prison. And in the, in the prison system, there is always an additional risk to child molesters. And to high profile defendants like her. All right. Do you think, this is from Martha May, do you think she could appeal for lack of evidence? So this is a good opportunity to kind of talk about JOA and what that kind of standard is and why this is kind of an argument for JOA and not necessarily an argument for appeal necessarily. Well, JOA is a, is a legal argument trying to convince the judge that if you look at all the evidence and you look at it in the light most favorable to the government, which means the prosecutor, there still isn't enough evidence for a reasonable jury to convict somebody. That's the argument to the judge. You can, however, appeal to an appellate court saying that there is a lack of evidence. Now, in this case, it's going to be kind of funny because this judge is going to go to the appellate court when this case is over, and you'll be appealing to her brethren, which are other judges on her same appellate court saying she convicted somebody for a lack of evidence. Uh, normally, that kind of brotherhood's pretty tight, and I would say the odds are slim on a lack of evidence. Now, she may have some real good arguments on legal mistakes that were made during the course of the trial, but a total lack of evidence, it's a very low bar, and it's very hard to get something reversed on, you know, on appeal on the lack of evidence. And the way the standards kind of set out in the JOA, which is a judgment of acquittal, is in the light most favorably seen to the unmoving party or the non-moving party, which would be if you viewed all these facts in the best case scenario for the government, there still isn't enough evidence to convict. That's how you win a JOA argument, which I've only seen one, one time ever. Um, I have, I'm just saying for myself, I've only seen yeah. one happen while I was in the courtroom. Um, and it's very unusual that they do win JOAs and it's very unlikely to appeal on that issue. A litany of errors, of small errors, is, is something you can go on. But usually you attack certain things like, I think, the witnesses not being able to extend them out because of the scheduling issues, not being able to attack the investigation. Things like that could be issues for appeal, potentially. All right. Let's see here. What other questions do we have? So here's a good one. New Chris, if she approaches the prosecutor with evidence of other crimes, can the prosecutor ask the judge to give her a low sentence? So let's let's get it into a, a realistic scenario. Let's say she gets convicted. And then let's say her lawyers then approach the prosecutor and say she wants to flip on all these other people. Is there a way for that to affect her sentence after she's been convicted? Yes. Um, in fact, there's even a way to do it after she's sentenced. Um, called Rule 35, 
uh, and that's a special rule for the prosecutor to come back to the judge and say, she's helped us uh, clean up an entire ring of sex trafficking, child minor sex trafficking. Uh, so we want her sentence cut in half, cut in a third. It's very common. Um, I've had it happen. I, I've had a case in New York where we had this happen. New York is the, the jurisdiction up there, very liberal on giving people benefits for cooperating. The problem she's going to have is right now she's the top of the heap. So everybody she's going to cooperate against is going to be below her, not as significant as she is. She'll get some benefit, but not as much as if she was able to give somebody above her. Now, if she's able to give some really high profile guy, and I won't say any names, but you know the names have been thrown around. If she's able to really give them one of those guys, she might get a tremendous benefit, but she's going to jail for some time, no matter what. They're not going to let her walk out. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting to see those things happen. Um, and usually you would make that offer and potentially that would happen before the trial and before she was convicted. But in a case like this, it wouldn't surprise me if the government wanted to get that conviction, do this trial, get their scapegoat potentially, then try to see if she would flip and they could use that in the future. So that wouldn't be yeah, this is the kind of case where this is the kind of case where there was no deals and no offers. Right, exactly. And I talked about how big of a difference that is in federal court versus state court. How it's much more likely for federal court for federal prosecutors not to make any offers. You can have life or you can have life, like we've gotten offered in cases. All right, so this is interesting to me. Natural individual. Why no charges of RICO in the Man Act like with R. Kelly? And so I'll just say before you give your answer, Dad. The R. Kelly case was the more unusual one. It's very unusual for them to do it in that kind of case. This is actually more normal charges based on these facts, in my opinion. But go ahead and give your thoughts. Well, um, I don't know about the Mann Act necessarily, because, I, again, I'd have to take a look at- Traveling across state was, lines for yeah, sexual everybody behavior. Was everybody was located and, and see how that all- Shuffled it around. does seem eerily similar to yeah. the R. Kelly case, flying yeah. these girls into New yeah. Mexico and Florida and, and New York. And then RICO, the, the key element in RICO is there has to be a central organization for a racketeering. I, I got to be honest with you, RICO and the Man Act, probably, you could probably fit it into the facts of this case. I agree. If you can fit it into R. Yeah. Kelly's case, this is very similar could. with the, the rule book and all that stuff, but they, they didn't. Well, so. they didn't. But they didn't really need it because that, that uh, uh, sex trafficking is a 40-year sentence. So they right. had about as heavy a sentence as you're going to get. All right. So that's all we've got. It's, we're at the hour mark here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this live. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for your questions. We enjoyed answering them. If you haven't hit the like button yet, please do that. Um, we'll continue to bring content when we get a verdict for in the Maxwell case. We'll try to come on and do another live. If my dad's available, I'll bring him on. When we get a Holmes verdict, I will bring Pete on, and we'll talk about that case. Let us know what cases are coming up that you want to hear about. And in a couple hours at about six o'clock today, uh, I did a video on Alec Baldwin, um, how there is a search warrant out now for his phone, which is a little shocking since I thought he was cooperating fully with law enforcement in this investigation. Has that changed and why? So check out that video. Um, and as always, thanks for being with us. Until next time. Thank you.